Good evening, everyone. Uh, if I had a gavel, I would bang it, but I don't, so I'm just going to have to use my voice to call this town hall meeting to order. All right, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen the town hall meeting is beginning. Uh, in this uh, city chambers, we ask that one person speaks at a time. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to hear your input and you will not be able to hear what we have to say. So welcome to Victoria City Hall, uh, located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples. Uh, tonight is a town hall meeting so that we can give you some information and hear your input on proposed regulations for medical marijuana related businesses in Victoria. We're going to begin with a presentation, a short presentation uh, from uh, Chris Coates and Shannon Craig in our Legislative Services Department who've been working with many of you on these regulations. And after we work through their presentation, I will then explain how the town hall portion of the meeting works. Uh, Mr. Coates, Ms. Craig, over to you. And can everyone hear okay? Very good. And I might ask the same question, but this is quite a powerful mic. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Coates. I'm the city clerk. And uh, my colleague Shannon and I have a, a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, to run through. And that will uh, start the evening off. So um, it is, as the mayor indicated, about proposed regulations for medical marijuana-related businesses in the city. Turning it on works. Um, so in May of 2015, uh, Council uh, received their first staff report uh, on this issue and uh, at that time there was um, 18 known businesses operating in the city. Since that time, there's been a significant increase in the number of, of mer medical marijuana related businesses operating in the city and we understand now that uh, that comes to about 30 businesses, 26 uh, to be storefront retailers. Only four of those businesses hold valid business licenses which allow uh, generally the sale of par paraphernalia and or consulting services. Some of the businesses having uh, community impacts are, some of the businesses are having uh, community impacts that are creating concerns for members of the public, for Victoria Police and for the city. Uh, in May when council received the initial staff report, uh, council did uh, give direction to staff to consult uh, and to bring forward for council's consideration proposed bylaw amendments, regulations actually aimed at mitigating community impacts and uh, concerns associated with the operation of these types of businesses in the city, as well as a proposed education and enforcement strategy. Um, part of the, uh, the first phase of the feedback collected, um, part of the first phase, sorry, was to collect feedback on those issues. Um, the survey that was put out at the time showed some support for, some strong support actually, for regulatory scheme, including age restrictions, security measures, signage and advertising restrictions, odor control, and limits on the number and location of businesses. The city also undertook a best practices review to see what other communities were doing with the same issue. Uh, proposed regulations were presented to council in November of 2015. At that time, Council directed staff to communicate those regulations and to invite feedback online and at an, at an engagement event, which is what is happening this evening. So that's, uh, that's a bit of the background and right now I'm going to turn it over to Shannon Craig, who's a policy analyst in our Legislative Services Department and she's going to lead uh, the presentation through just to talk a little bit about what regulations Council's looked at and those that uh, uh, Council's looking for some uh, feedback on this evening. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, the purpose of the proposed regulations as a whole is to reduce the community impacts of medical marijuana-related businesses while still maintaining some access to medical marijuana. And I'm going to go through some of the proposed regulations, um, and they're grouped a bit about uh, the nature of the concerns that they're meant to address. So first off, we have um, a number of regulations that are meant to address health and safety concerns. and. Um, Marijuana is not an approved drug or medicine in Canada, so there's certainly some uh, health risks associated with it, and certain individuals may be at greater risk of adverse health effects, and that includes minors. Um, so some of the specific uh, regulations that are meant to address concerns about access by minors, um, we have no individuals under the age of 19 being allowed on business premises. 
We also have um, some regulations here about advertising and promotion. So certainly the idea is that there would be no advertising or promoting the use of marijuana to a minor. Uh, signage should be very discreet. Um, some of the other health and safety related regulations that would apply to storefront retailers include posting health and safety warning signs on the premises. Uh, there's also some regulations that would prohibit delivery or mailing of products to customers. And finally, the final proposed regulation in this category is a prohibition against the sale of edible products other than tinctures, capsules, or edible oils. Now, I know that the regulation of edible products is um, one of those regulations that we're getting a lot of feedback on, so I certainly wanted to take a little bit of time to explain some of the background to that one. Um, we know that businesses currently sell oils, baked goods, candies, other food products containing marijuana, and that there certainly are some benefits to customers that ingest products um, via food. Um, during some site visits to various businesses, we saw that the labeling and packaging for these products varies quite considerably. And that raised some concerns because a lack of proper labels or packaging um, raises concerns about consumers overestimating the dosage that's required or others might accidentally ingest products. And certainly um, access by children is a concern here. Um, certainly one of the secondary concerns we have is around food safety of these products, not necessarily because of handling practices at the businesses themselves, but because they seem to come from unregulated production facilities where they're prepared. Um, so we've heard a lot of feedback already um, that the city implement various quality control measures that would help to ensure these products uh, can be consumed safely. Um, but one of the constraints we have in this regard is that the city has no authority to actually regulate the sale of medical marijuana. So we're trying to craft our regulations so that they're um, directed at business operations. What this means, because of these limitations, we're proposing a rather cautious or conservative approach towards the sale of edibles. Um, we're certainly saying that if the city doesn't have the ability to put in place regulations to ensure products safely, then we don't feel comfortable that they would be sold. So moving forward with some of the other regulations, we have a set here that are meant to address neighborhood impacts. Uh, those could include things like odor, loitering, and certainly if there's clustering of shops in neighborhoods, we're heard that that can exacerbate some of those concerns. Uh, the first one we have up here would be a requirement that uh, storefront retailers should be at least 200 meters from schools and other storefront retailers. Um, this type of requirement would have to be implemented in conjunction with changes to our zoning regulation bylaw, which would mean that businesses would likely need to apply for a rezoning in order to sell medical marijuana. There's also a couple regulations here to respond to older concerns. Uh, propose that there's no uh, consumption of marijuana on the premises and also that air filtration systems have to be installed and maintained. The final category of proposed regulations are meant to address security concerns. Uh, we know that some storefront retailers have become targets of criminal activity. Um, there's also concerns that these businesses are easy targets for organized crime groups who could be infiltrating or profiting from those businesses. Uh, so some of the proposed regulations to address uh, these security concerns are some limitations on opening hours. We're proposing that businesses can only be open between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. There's also a proposed prohibition against other businesses being conducted on the premises and some requirements that would uh, come into effect when business license applications would be submitted and also on renewal, things like security plans, police information checks, and proof of security alarm contracts. Just to follow up with the few last security concern related proposed regulations, uh, to deter thefts, we are proposing that at least two employees would be on duty at all times. Also that windows must not be blocked so that passerbys would be able to uh, see what's going on inside the business. And then to minimize the consequences of any security incidents, uh, there's some requirements here for video surveillance cameras, monitored security and fire alarm systems, and the removal or securing of valuables when the business isn't in operation.
So that's the full set of the proposed regulations. Um, we certainly invite any feedback you might have on those tonight. In terms of our next steps, we're going to review feedback received tonight. We also have an online survey that's going on until March 4th, um, and, and we're also receiving written submissions as well. Uh, based on all that feedback, we'll uh, look to see what people had to say and develop some final recommendations to Council. Um, as mentioned earlier, part of the direction we had from Council was to develop an education enforcement strategy uh, that will outline how we're going to implement and enforce any new regulations. We're going to bring the final recommendations, that strategy, and all the feedback that we received uh, to Council in April to get uh, their feedback and direction. We're also going to share the feedback received with the federal government. Council had asked us to do that when they considered this issue back in November. And then based on whatever we hear from Council in April, we'll uh, make changes and then prepare and present any bylaw amendments um, to Council for approval in May. Thanks. That concludes my presentation and look forward to hearing your feedback on the regulations. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Craig and Mr. Coates. Uh, I want to uh, introduce Staff Sergeant Connor King from Vic PD, who's with us this evening. And I'd also uh, like to ask, uh, on behalf of our fire chief, that we have a clear exit. So we need to keep one corridor uh, free for people to come and go. So if you could monitor that, those of you by the door, that would be great. Okay, so we're going to begin the town hall portion, and I'm just going to explain how it works. Um, there was some thought, uh, I think some people were told they would have five minutes to speak. Uh, that's when we thought there'd be 20 people here. Uh, so when we have a full chambers like this, uh, we do go to a three-minute speaking time for everyone uh, to make sure that everyone is heard. So uh, on the uh, podium, uh, there's a little series of lights. Uh, green is when you start. Uh, at one minute, the light will go to yellow. And when it turns red at zero, uh, I will ask you to stop. And I really truly will ask everybody to honor the time limit because um, while everyone has a lot to say, we want to make sure that everybody is heard. So if everyone has three minutes, uh, that's fair. And I will cut you off uh, at three minutes. The other uh, kind of ground rule, um, some people may be here visiting City Hall for the first time and getting up and speaking at the microphone for the first time. And we want to make sure tonight and every night uh, that when we have a public meeting, it's a safe place for everyone. So I imagine there'll be a diversity of views uh, in, the, uh, in the gallery this evening, and we welcome a diversity of views. Uh, what we don't welcome is clapping or booing. Because if you stand up there at the microphone and you say something and everyone claps, it feels fantastic, and you feel like, yeah, that was a great point. Uh, if someone boos and it's your first time ever standing up speaking in front of people, it feels really hard. So you can clap and boo inside yourselves, feel it. But uh, if you could make this, uh, help us make this a safe place for everybody, that would be great. So with that, the microphone is open. There's a lineup uh, alongside the portrait of Mayor's Wall over there. So if you're in line, uh, you can feel free to come and speak. And we'll go through everybody, and we'll be here till we're done. So the microphone is now open. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Council, my name's Kirk Tusa. I'm a barrister. Uh, I represent a number of dispensaries in this city and somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 dispensaries across Canada. Uh, I commend the city for its willingness to take the step of uh, legitimizing and normalizing the storefront sale of medical cannabis. I think it's an important step, uh, it's a necessary step, and it's a long overdue step. Uh, I was also counsel uh, in a Supreme Court of Canada case, the first one to address the issue uh, of access to medical cannabis by patients and those who use medical cannabis to improve their quality of life. Uh, and that case originated here in Victoria uh, with the arrest of uh, my client Owen Smith for making edible products uh, for the Cannabis Buyers Club of Canada, a dispensary that's been operating in Victoria for more than a decade uh, and is one of the oldest dispensaries in North America. Um, there's a bit of irony uh, to that because the Supreme Court of Canada in June of last year unanimously decided that the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act uh, was unconstitutional to the extent that it banned uh, and prohibited patients from accessing non-dried marijuana forms of medical cannabis. In other words, primarily uh, edible and topical cannabis products. Uh, so I'm here to make three uh, discrete points. 
about the proposed bylaws. Uh, the first relates to the uh, proposed ban on uh, edible cannabis products. Uh, it's a mistake. Uh, and it's a mistake that will harm patients in this community, will take away people's quality of life, uh, and will actually have the exact opposite effect that it's intended. Uh, because if you send someone who has no experience making these products home uh, with cannabis oil, for example, and ask them to make their own cookies, you are going to increase uh, the chances of uh, ingesting too much. Uh, you're going to increase the chances that uh, people who shouldn't be accessing it are accessing it. Uh, and you're going to actually cause the kind of harms that you're seeking to prevent. There are other ways to do it, including packaging requirements that the city can impose jurisdictionally and that would survive a challenge. Secondly, uh, the 200 meter uh, restriction uh, I think is a mistake. These dispensaries pr provide community-based access. Uh, if you shut them down because of a declustering situation, you're going to drive patients away from a comfortable uh, environment that they use to access medical cannabis. You're going to put uh, their uh, convenience and their uh, and their quality of life beneath um, some arbitrary cutoff point that serves no particularly good purpose. Third, uh, and I noticed that the yellow light is shining in my eyes, so I'll be very quickly uh, on this point. Uh, if people have proper air filtration systems, there's no reason to ban on-site consumption. There are many reasons to allow on-site consumption uh, for members of dispensaries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Okay. Um, hello, Mayor and Council. My name is Ted Smith. I live at 1246 Gladstone Avenue. Um, it is a, a great honor to be before you tonight. Uh, as you know, I've been coming before this Council for two decades to see these changes happen and uh, to see uh, this. Uh, it's just very humbling. Um, that being said, while we're, we're very grateful that, that the police might not be busting at our door as, as quickly after this, um, we still have some concerns with the regulations. I'll pass out our newspaper, the Cannabis Digest, that has a feature story, page 32, on our safe inhalation room. Um, that room is critically important to the patients at our club and uh, their lives. And, and our club, it's the difference between a, a store and a community center. And it has made a, a dramatic difference in people's lives, not only with using cannabis, because we can teach new patients how to use this medicine. We can teach old patients new tricks. And, you know, but it also helps them have a community and a place to go. Um, many of them would be kicked out of their homes if they smoked at home. Um, same with cooking if their own cookies or making their own food products at home. You know, that would be putting them at risk. And it's really strange to see some of the rules putting people at risk. We've had that smoking room at the club for uh, a long time now. It's not a, a problem in our neighborhood. So to, to have this space be, be put at risk because there's so many clubs in town, you have to license them, is very unfair to our members. And, and I, I would hope that if it, it can't be made that all the clubs are allowed this, that you would at least allow this, this club that's been around for 20 years um, providing this refugee center to patients, the most seriously ill in town. And, and, it, and it breaks my heart to think that they're going to be put on the street to smoke their cannabis. It's, it's the most bizarre, backward situation that I could imagine. But, but here it is. Um, and with the edibles as well, it's really sad after we've changed federal law to think that we might not be able to sell cookies. Um, and yeah, and not allowing children in the store. We have a lot of members that, that are single parents that don't know what they're going to do to get their medicine. So these are some rules that I, I hope you reconsider. Um, and I know you're very passionate people and, and you will think hard. So thank you very much for giving me this time to speak. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Mayor and Council. Uh, good to see you. My name's Kit Warren. I'm uh, one of the directors at Shadow Mountain Health and Wellness. So I'm going to speak directly about uh, safety for our children. They look like peanuts, but it's genetically modified corn syrup. One of the things that cannabis helps out with is health and wellness. All these products that are at every gas station in the country 
is giving us cancer by way of Bt toxin, which is a genetically modified organism in the cheap corn syrup. And you're telling me that you have to protect us from a flower that heals us? Thank you very much. I'll take the Snickers bar. Uh, Ms. Craig, could we remove the props from the podium, please? Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Hello, Madam Mayor and Councillors. My name is Lauren Milne. I'm one of the owners of 546 Yates Street, and uh, we have um, a trees dispensary within our building. Um, I've been a landlord in that building and in Victoria in general for a number of years. I was very apprehensive with respect to uh, the initial uh, thought that they would go into our building. My son, uh, Jordan, uh, convinced me that I shouldn't allow my preconceptions, perhaps from my age, to uh, uh, cloud my vision. And I want to say that the uh, tenant has been an exceptionally good tenant for us. They're honorable, professional people. They run a, a very good business in our view. Uh, they, I would like to see them be able to um, uh, conduct other uh, related businesses within our space, such as a wellness center and uh, acupuncture, things like this, art therapy. And I would encourage, uh, from a landlord's perspective, uh, council to support this operation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Ashley Abraham. I am currently an employee at the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. I wanted to speak in regards to the proposed regulations. Um, a few points. One would be the concern of edible products. I believe that with the case that has just been passed through the uh, Federal Court of Canada, that to propose regulations um, banning edibles would be a mistake. I think that going the route of putting proposed regulations on packaging would be much more suitable and in line with uh, your hopes. Secondly, I would like to address the um, proposal for no consumption on site. I also think this is a mistake. There are, um, although the organization I work for doesn't allow patient consumption on site, I do recognize it as being very important. There are many people in Victoria who live in rental um, conditions that do not allow consumption, whether it's a condo, low-income housing, and these are people who need to be able to use their medicine, and they need a safe place to be able to do it. So if they're facing uh, two options, one is being evicted from their housing, or to use their medicine on the street, uh, which is very much not what we're looking for in our community. We don't want these people in parks or in back alleys. They are medicinal users and they deserve a safe place to access their medicine. So um, either allowing consumption on site or allowing uh, a place that is solely for that use would be uh, very important. Um, and other than that, I want to thank you for taking the uh, bold step towards regulating medical marijuana businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Pardon me. Thank you. And Ms. Craig, would it be possible to uh, pop back to the slide about edibles and specifically the concerns you had about them? Thanks. Uh, sorry, guys, just give me one second here. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. My name is Brandon Wright, and I'm the general manager of Baked Edibles, uh, which is a commercial bakery that supplies dispensaries across the island. Um, I'm a scientist at heart, and I believe in measurement. And I'm not going to tell you how success should be measured, but simply that without measurement, there can be no success in regulation or medication. Um, I'm going to show you why edibles are one of the easiest forms of consumption to measure, and the only subset of medical cannabis that already has extensive and thoroughly developed regulation designed and controlled by government-sponsored bodies although it is at the provincial level, albeit. Um, my first point is about measuring dosage. I'm not going to speak for any other form of cannabis consumption, but what I'm going to do is walk you through exactly the process by which we determine exactly which medicinal compounds we use in our products and in what quantities. THC, CBD, and many other extracted cannabinoids, as you probably are all now familiar with, um, are extracted into oils, just like coconut oils, 
and to the RSOs that you've speak, spoken, um, that we've seen already. This oil is then precisely measured and tested for the exact cannabinoid profile and the amounts of those cannabinoids in the oils. So when we have this oil, we know exactly what's in it. That oil is then measured precisely and baked into large batches. This really reduces the amount of spillage or any sort of, um, any sort of guesswork. At the end of cooking, each batch is then sent off for testing so that at the end of each batch, we know exactly what's in all of our products. This is how we successfully measure and label the medicinal compounds of our products. This is how the men and women who use our products are able to consistently measure and the doses that they are giving themselves. The second point I wanted to make is about measuring regulations. There are a significant amount of regulations in place already at the provincial level with regards to food health safety, and these exist in the form of VHA, Vancouver Island Health Authority, and their food, uh, various food inspections, and a lot of the labeling requirements that are already in place in, across Canada for food. Um, I, as we, we recently opened this month, and over the past four weeks, I have personally been through three health inspections to make sure that our bakery is up to standards with regards to food health practices. This isn't an issue that needs to be regulated at the Victoria level. It it's, can be left to the provincial government with regards to food health safety. This body is already in place. Um, and this is why we, we, uh, we firmly state that cannabis edibles are one of the easiest ways for the patient to measure their cannabis intake, and food production is already regulated well enough. By following the food industry standards, we're creating a much safer product for our clients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Madam Mayor, Council. My name is Renee Melody Gagnon. I'm chapter um, chair with Women Grow Vancouver Island, part of the world's largest organization of professional women cannabis uh, executives. Um, I was also the first licensed producer on Vancouver Island. We operated at a Saanich, so I'm very familiar with the federal regulations. And I would like to speak from the fact that I support the growth of the dispensary industry within the framework that already exists. There's enough re 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 regulation at the MMPR level to transfer down. And I'd like to specifically address the monitored video. It doesn't exist at the LP level. And so you're adding a super um, burden upon anybody in Victoria to follow that regulation. At the federal level now, it's the live uh, motion capture stored for two years. So you need alignment with the federal reg, not be more than it. I can also um, say that this industry is a potential godsend for women entrepreneurs and minority business owners in this country. It is an untapped industry that we haven't even begun to exploit. And that if we look at certain regulations, there's a potential that accidentally you will exclude the participation of small businesses, making this only possible for large, well-funded organizations which will not represent the, either the patients or the community at large. What we need to build in right now is diversity and inclusion into the regulations to ensure that more people participate within the regulatory framework for the best amount. Right now, demand is 2,000, supply is one. Right now, building anti-competitive measures into regulations will actually interfere with the healthy development of this industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my name is Kelly Coulter. I am also with Women Grow, so I'll make this very brief because I'm very nervous. <laughs> in the spirit of sustainable, inclusive growth in the cannabis industry, Vancouver Island has historically been a role model, partially due to the economics of island life. Small businesses thrive here in all sectors. The cannabis industry should be no different in the future. I am particularly concerned for women who are currently providers for the existing dispensaries with artisanal can cannabis products. Many of these women live in rural communities where jobs are seasonal, seasonal at best. Many of these women may also be supporting their families with the subsidy of income cannabis provides. This applies to women across Canada, actually. We should take this into consideration moving forward. It's estimated women comprise up to 90% of the added value products in the dispensaries. If these women are not able to continue to provide their products and garner income, they will likely have to resort to government assistance. This would be a travesty in my opinion. 
The first step of regulating dispensaries will impact how the future is framed here on the island with respect to adult use regulations. If Victoria implements forward-thinking regulations, the island will create, will create a system of marijuana security that I believe other regions may also consider moving forward. This would be visionary on your part. There are many Canadian regions which rely solely on this currently illegal agribusiness, and so once it becomes legal, we should be very cognizant of the potential models, and ideally, they will be sustainable, local, and ethically minded. The potential for the future adult use industry, cannabis craft industry on the islands are significant due to the history, market, expertise, and existing hospitable political climate. It is with this in mind that I would strongly encourage the members of this council to consider the following. All cannabis flower be sourced from island producers. All cannabis products, lotions, salves, balms, tinctures, and oils, as well as edibles, if allowed, be sourced from local island producers. I think I've run out of time. Thank you very much. Oh, actually, you still have some time. Oh, okay. I kind of wanted to go. <laughs> although, this, although this possibly is not within the parameters of the current agenda, it is something which should be considered for future agendas. The cannabis industry of the future will be an economic boon to a number of regions across Canada, much like the wine industry, but only if policymakers, economists, and politicians get ahead of the curve. I would be happy to talk with you further on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, my name is Dieter McPherson. I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club, of which Ted Smith just spoke. Uh, I am attempting to fill his very large shoes. Uh, I'm also with the Canadian Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries, which is an industry association formed in 2011 uh, to develop and implement a set of best practices to regulate the industry, barring any regulations coming from the provincial or federal governments. Uh, we were uh, integral in the Vancouver process. We were included for one class of license. In Vancouver, they looked to differentiate between compassion clubs and dispensaries. Uh, our trade membership program was the key difference between the two classes of licensing. Oh, got some interesting noise. Um, so, uh, first of all, what I would like to say is the process here in Victoria has been a night and day difference from the one in Vancouver. By having an inclusive process that was heavily involved within the community, you had staff, we have police that have gone out to get to know the operators, it has made a world of difference. This is far more informed than what happened in Vancouver. Uh, my major concerns, both as a director of the VCBC and as a director of the Cannabis, uh, Canadian Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries, is edibles. You'll be hearing this all tonight, I'm sure. Uh, I think the cogent point was in the report from city staff, there were three options. The first was uh, status quo ante, do nothing. The second was adopt CAMCD standards. And the third was adopt the Vancouver standards. Um, I believe that the two options that you could look to are one, do nothing, allow the sale and let the food industry manage itself. VHOD does have authority over this. This was already brought up. If something is being sold as a food product, it has to be produced in a food safe environment, whether it's a legal business or not, those regulations exist. Two, CAMCD has put forward a set of draft, st draft standards for packaging, labeling, testing. Um, those have been given to city staff and uh, if you haven't already see received it, we'll send it to you. Uh, second of all, one of our major concerns is the 19 and under. Uh, in the liquor industry and the regulations in this city, it's very clear that no child should be on the premises without parent supervision. I am unclear as to why there needs to be a distinction between liquor and cannabis in the case of under 19 usage. Uh, it would seem for, for ease of policy and implementation and for the concerns of the public that adopting the same measures would make sense. Anybody under the age of 19 needs to be under the care and supervision. Um, we might be able to put something in there about they have to be parents or guardians, which can be proved. I'm not entirely sure. Third is the safe inhalation site, which may be a difficult one because the CRD obviously has jurisdiction over that as well. Though I would say the CRD bylaws are not specific to cannabis and only list tobacco. So currently as it stands, uh, there are no regulations against, against consuming cannabis on site and your bylaw implementation would set a precedent banning the consumption of cannabis indoors. Uh, at least as far as businesses are concerned. So take care um, because that would be setting a precedent because that does not exist anywhere else at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name's Colin. I live in the community here. What I'd like to see is um, I'd like to have as a cannabis user 
everything the drinkers have. I want the bars. I want the cruise lines. I want the resorts. I want to play stoned golf. And I want to watch our community flourish. And that's what's going to happen with this plant. You can't stop it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. I'm probably not going to be as funny. Uh, my name is Kate Dalgleish. I'm with Green Mountain. We do business consulting for the medical marijuana industry. I've reached out to almost every dispensary in Victoria and spoken with them about what they feel in terms of the regulations. And there's largely been a broad consensus on several points. Uh, dispensaries as a whole very strongly desire to comply with regulations, to become uh, licensed, and to become fully legitimized. However, they also very, very strongly care about their patients and about patient welfare and about harm reduction. Uh, there's a risk that if the regulations are too strict and too onerous, that dispensaries will not be able to comply with them. And then there is a risk of having a similar situation like Vancouver, where there's only uh, 14 given initial licensing, and then the huge issue of the Board of Variance Appeals and the dispensaries that are open, and then the City of Vancouver having to put a lot of resources into enforcing dispensaries that are still operating uh, without licensing. Uh, in terms of edibles, you've heard many people talking about edibles and the uh, concern about a ban, ban on edibles is very strong. Uh, the industry has been starting to self-regulate, including increasing dark packaging and increasing labeling uh, to make sure that it's a very proper, uh, proper industry. Uh, there's a few other points that are very, uh, in terms of a, a problem, there's questions about the, how the 200 meter limit will work uh, in terms, it's been unclear about who gets to be in the 200 meter limit, what qualifies, who gets to be the actual dispensary, if there are multiple ones that are too close, how that will go through. So people are unsure, is it based on demerits, is it based on seniority? Uh, so that has been unclear and that has been a state of worry for a lot of dispensaries. Uh, there's also the rezoning issue, uh, how that has been not addressed and it's just a very vague statement. Uh, dispensaries that may have to move due to having no license, will they have to go through the rezoning process? Uh, dispensaries that want to open a, another location, will they have to go through the rezoning process? Uh, there's also concern about the language used for signage when that minors must not be able to know that medicinal marijuana is being sold at a location. Uh, this language is very much overbroad, and you can see how it uh, doesn't compare compared to, say, you know, BC Liquor Store having it right there on the, uh, the big sign. So there's a lot of dispensaries that are concerned about the very vague language in terms of how to keep minors out. Dispensaries currently ban minors, and they, want, they don't want to sell to minors. They don't want minors involved, but they're concerned that this language may prevent them from even having a certain name of their, of their dispensary or any kind of signage. So it's very overbroad, and I think a lot of dispensaries are concerned about having a much more clear definition about what to look forward to. So as it stands, there's a lot of uncertainty in this, and there's a hope that this will create, uh, that the city will be able to come up with clearer uh, uh, plans. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Julia Vaintrop. I currently work at Beard Brothers, which is one of the uh, nonprofit medicinal dispensaries. Um, at 21 years old, I had early cervical cancer and I had major complications with the removal. For about six and a half years, I went through about five operations with my final sixth operation ending up in Vancouver with the surgeon. Uh, throughout this whole period, I was put on heavy doses of Oxycontin and became very physically addicted to the medication. And when I came to the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club, I was really in a state of desperation uh, because that medication made it very hard to live a normal life. Um, what I was able to do with cannabis edibles, where I was able to completely detox off the medication without any form of withdrawal symptom. So I'm telling you, after six and a half years of opiates, every single day, I did not throw up once. And the reason that it is so important that we allow edibles specifically, even though there are options as oils and tinctures and things like that, is because in oftentimes that would be the only thing I'd get in my stomach that day, 
or in the morning. And VCBC has options like uh, meal replacements. So they have these Buddha balls where there's protein, there's all sorts of different health things, they're raw. So there are a lot of other options. Um, and, you know, we've already discussed with the federal government that people have the right to use cannabis medicinally through edibles. Um, so the only other option we're giving people is to make it in their homes. And I believe doing so would be putting people at great risk. Um, I believe it would be un unconstitutional. Same thing as uh, the safe inhalation sites. Um, and specifically under Section 10 of the Human Rights Code for Discrimination in Attendancy Premises, we're going to open up a really big can of worms for our landlords because if somebody, uh, you know, is trying to make their cookies and doesn't want to get evicted and has to argue that they have the right to have medicinal cannabis and make it and create the smell associated with baking their own edibles, um, you know, that's going to put their child at greater risk of possibly evicting or, you know, being evicted from their premises. So I really believe that uh, that is something that really needs to be addressed and, and left. And I mean, in terms of candies and variety, I can tell you if you've ever had to eat the same cookie every single day for six years, variety is a beautiful thing. And, um, and that's something that is definitely necessary. Um, so yeah, I am really hoping that uh, the city will will reconsider this. Um, the product that I took most often is currently banned by the city, which is the full strength hash brownie. After six and a half years, my tolerance went pretty high, and if I had to eat the amount of cookies necessary to get the medicine that I needed, I probably would not have been able to have kept them down and healed as I have. Um, it's been 17 months since I've had any form of opiates. I've been able to treat any form of chronic pain with specifically cannabis, and now I'm able to live a completely healthy, happy, normal life. So I'm hoping you'll allow other people to do this as well. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello. Hello, my name is uh, Chris Marks. I'm a volunteer member with the Board of Directors of the Vancouver Island Compassion Society and uh, otherwise involved in the community. And I'm here to speak tonight about a few things. Edibles have already been talked, uh, spoken about a lot. Um, at the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, all our recipes are online and, and clients can make or bake them if they wish. The vast majority of them choose to uh, buy their the cookies from the club for the consistency and the ease. And myself, with uh, home health care, I don't have the time to pay my tenants to bake a batch of cookies for me. I don't have that extra time in my budget. So it's just very convenient to be able to go to a club and access those. Um, and you better better consistency from a standardized, licensed you know, business than individual homemakers do them in their home right off the bat. Um, I'd also like to discuss um, delivery. There's a lot of clients, our clients of over 2,700 of them, the average age is of 56, 57. There's a lot of people who can't make it out that easy and so they do get stuff uh, delivered to their place and so I'd like to um, make a provision for that somehow to, to get those to the clients who need it the most because those are often the ones who need it the most who can't get out to the clubs. And um, also, I'd find it, I'd like to make the distinction between, you know, as Dieter said, uh, compassion clubs versus dispensaries. Uh, we're 100% nonprofit. Our board of directors are not remunerated in any way. And we, you know, our, our, our clients have a high standard of entry with, with doctor's referrals and stuff. And, um, uh, you know, there are 16 years in history, and the CBC's 20 years in history have kind of paved the way for, for what's happening with all these clubs. And so we just like to, make that distinction that we're not kind of hit with onerous um, business licensing fees. Um, and as far as the regulations I've seen, I think we comply with most of them already, including the uh, installation of uh, video cameras and stuff. So we're, we're, we're in line and, and want to work with the city. Uh, in, we'd just like to keep these uh, few things in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Hi there. Uh, my name is Isaac Greenwood. I'm an insurance broker uh, here in Victoria. I run a, a national program working with dispensaries and licensed growers across Canada. Uh, I actually, most of my clients in Victoria are here in the room. Um, when I when I look at this this discussion, I think that safety is one thing that comes into people's minds a lot um, in terms of who's using the dispensaries. And, uh, and what type of business is actually taking place. And, and I think that right now Canada is really watching what's going on here in Victoria because there's a lot of uh, people looking to see where 
where the future is with this. And, and I have to say that as a tourist, 10 years ago coming to visit Victoria in front of this very building, uh, you could find four or five different entrepreneurs trying to operate their own dispensaries out of their, their pockets. So it's, uh, it's quite remarkable to see how, how dispensaries have, at least in my mind on the streets, eliminated uh, that element of crime that, that I was exposed to. So that's, that's terrific. Um, a, lot of, a lot of everything's been discussed so far, but I will say from, from an insurance perspective, um, regardless of your opinion on it, we're, we're an industry of large numbers that's backed by uh, actuarial scientists who, who look at statistics and, and really look across the planet to see what's going on. And while I would like to insure, of course, every dispensary in, in Canada, unfortunately not everyone uh, qualifies uh, or is insurable. So the process of going through this, it, it is quite in-depth and it does uh, require a lot of, of compliance and transparency. So when I look at the safety of baked goods, um, in, in my mind, having insured pharmaceutical companies who have worked from clinical trials to launching actual drugs, uh, it's much easier for me to work with insurance carriers and the bakeries than it is to actually deal with larger pharmaceutical companies. So I think that's, that's definitely one interesting thing to look at. Um, when it does come to perhaps declustering or, or shutting down dispensaries in the city of Victoria like is taking place in Vancouver, um, one consideration should be that Victoria really is one of the only safe harbors for dispensaries on the island. So it is a large community, Souk, Langford, uh, Duncan. The next place where you can, you can buy uh, uh, medical marijuana from somebody aside from a drug dealer on the street is Nanaimo, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So do please take that into consideration uh, because the public does want this. They do use it frequently. And when it comes to deciding who um, should be in business, um, not to, to say a selfless plug, but I think insurability is definitely a litmus test as to uh, who should be honoured with the privilege of having a licensed dispensary in the city of Victoria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor Helps and Council. <clears throat> I'll just ask that you forgive my eyewear. I have an ocular condition. I don't mean any disrespect. Uh, I would just like to start by saying uh, my qualifications. My name is James Whitehead. I own and operate the Gorge Cannabis Dispensary. Um, first of all, I would like to extend a sincere thanks to yourself, uh, to your council, to the representatives of our local police department for the climate in which dispensaries currently get to operate in this city. I think that it's uh, remarkable that there are as many dispensaries as there are and that they are allowed to operate uh, as freely as they are allowed to operate. I think it's a very special thing and I just want to acknowledge that to start, so thank you for that. Um, I think that many of the concerns that your proposed legislations uh, bring up and people have been addressed tonight. Uh, I would like to speak to what I feel are the unaddressed concerns uh, that are not really brought up in your proposed legislations. Um, as a person who is involved in providing cannabis to others, my main tool to uh, provide good outcomes is cannabis itself. And there is nothing in any of this legislation that speaks to daylighting the production supply chain for cannabis. Uh, one of the things that is a major frustration for me is that I am forced to essentially obtain medical products in a clandestine format and then do my best based on my own good judgment, my own morality, my own ethics, and a whole host of other concerns which I alone am left to navigate to get a hold of the best medicine I can at the best price and then in turn provide that to people. So if your core concern is public health and safety, which is what I see this discussion about, I feel that these legislations are window dressing on a home that doesn't have a foundation yet. Until you can allow myself and others who are involved in the provision of cannabis services to daylight their supply chain and to apply effective controls to that supply chain in terms of what those plants are fed, how they're cured, how they come to market, really this is all a purposeless discussion. Those are the things that need core attention. And until that happens, we are essentially talking about uh, open hours or what can and cannot be sold when the main issue is yet to be addressed. And so that's my point that I'd like to leave with you to consider. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Oh, we're just going to do a little microphone adjusting because it seems to be having a mind of its own a little bit. Thanks, Mr. Coates. Welcome. Uh, my name is Bernard von Schulman. I think a lot of you in council already know me from other stuff. I am involved with uh, Raven Herbal Supply Cooperative, which uh, we're on Cook Street next door to Wellburns. Um, since much has been said about many other things, I'm going to jump really quickly down to a um, bit of data I can offer to you. Um, we, because uh, I keep track of data a lot, um, I can tell you that our clientele is not quite what I expected as the demographic in the first place. One third of our clientele is um, under age 35. Uh, one third is 35 to age 50. And one third of it is 50 or older. And our largest growing segment of people who are joining us are people are age 60 and older and disproportionately women. So our average currently is a 46-year-old woman who is coming in for chronic pain. Well, now, this relates then to edibles very specifically because um, our data is showing that um, women are more likely to buy edibles than men. And the older people are, the more likely they are to buy edibles. Uh, so on the young end of the scale, um, a man in his 20s is um, very unlikely to be buying edibles, less than 20% of the time. A woman who is age 55 or older, it is almost um, only what they're buying is edibles. Now, edibles, for us, what we're seeing is why the interest in them is because there's very you can have a very controlled dosage of what you're taking. It's very clear how much you're getting. And we have a, our primary supplier um, gives us products with it labeled, how much THC or um, CBD is in each product. And not only that, they actually provide us with test results showing how much is actually in it so that we can actually, um, we, you know, we can know from their testing what they're offering. So for us, the edibles are very, are, have been a very important thing for people, especially with chronic pain, who are trying to get off of um, things like oxycodone, Vicodin, Percocet, et cetera, and don't want to be taking major pain, um, um, pain medications such as that. Um, just to quickly raise one other issue is the on-site consumption. We have a number of people in their 50s and 60s who really have never taken cannabis before and they're interested in taking the edibles to see if this will work for them to deal with their pain management issues. What we want to be able to offer them is a safe place to try this to see does this work, is this a viable alternative for them, is this a viable way to get off of various different opiates. And if we can't offer this on site, which we currently don't offer, we have to basically say to people, go home, try it. Go slow, be careful with it, don't go crazy with it. But we'd like to be able to offer people the chance to do it on site so they could um, have a, a, a safer place to do it. And uh, that's about all I can offer, unless you have a quick question, anybody? We're not asking Oh, you're not asking a question. We've got, okay. We're all writing things down. I think we okay. have lots of questions, but it's our time to hear from you tonight. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is uh, Bruce Dean, uh, 14 years licensed, federally licensed to grow and possess, and uh, many times harassed by the police, had my home entered three times, but not all because of my medical marijuana license. So we don't need to, we shouldn't be operating this system on more fear mongering. I heard a presentation at the beginning about talking about the, uh, uh, the effects of marijuana, the negative effects of it, whatever like they were facts, and they definitely are not facts. A lot of them is very debatable. The, uh, I'm very up in the scientific research, and it wasn't. They were presented as facts, and that's fear mongering. Um, limiting the access to it, limiting the number of sites we can get it from, should be maybe limited to the number of places we can get drugs that can kill at. Like we have stores all over town that say drugs, drugs, drugs out front, and you can go buy these drugs that can actually kill, and marijuana doesn't kill. So keep that in mind when you're talking again with fear mongering about the limiting the number of access places. Same with consumption on site, that's ridiculous. You can consume booze, a recreational deadly drug. Uh, I worked in youth detox before my disability, and that's the only drug we were not allowed to detox youth from is if we didn't have a nurse on staff. Any other drug, crack, whatever, we could detox them, no problem, and we would not admit people for supposed marijuana addictions. So again, that ease up on the fear mongering, and uh, I think I pretty well covered. Oh yeah, edibles. If you're as soon as I saw the note on there about limiting edibles and stuff, you know this is based again from fear mongering and not from facts. If you, the person who'd done that up had done their homework, they would know that edibles. It's, it's a no-brainer that edibles should be allowed. It is, that's the number one way that most people like to consume it and prefer to and safely can consume it. So we, can't, we should not be limiting ourselves 
uh, on the edible end of it. Um, access for youth, again, it's silly. You can, you're allowed to drink well, alcohol with your, your child at your, in your home. You can't even go pick up your medication with your child. It's just that, and that's silly. And then how many children are we finding increasing and increasing more are being prescribed medical marijuana for their conditions like epileptic seizures and whatnot. And so they can't even go into the store to get their own medication again. That just is not, doesn't make sense and doesn't fit with logic on that too. So um, I've covered it all. Thank you very much for your time. But I am very happy the city is doing this. I mean, this is great and very progressive that we are doing this and just we should do it without the fear mongering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hello. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, my name is Alex Robb. I'm the community liaison for Trees Cannabis Dispensary. Uh, I've been watching this whole process since May from, from the audience, and I'm really happy that we're here to the point of public engagement. Uh, there's been many points that have been raised tonight that are very good. I'm going to keep mine uh, focused on one that I haven't heard much about, and it's about the economic benefits of dispensaries in Victoria, as well as regional development benefits. So in 2013, the Conservative government, they created a medical marijuana regime that privileged corporations. Uh, it minimized connections to local community. The primary, mul primary multiplier effects were for the security industry, high-end construction, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. In Victoria, the dispensaries employ at least hundreds of young people uh, those hundreds of young people, the, there are enormous multiplier effects towards the rest of the community. And it's in this vein that I want to make one focused recommendation to the city staff writing the recommendations. And that is, rather than an outright ban on other business uses on the same premises, I would suggest including and allowing for health and wellness services to be offered as a business use alongside cannabis dispensaries. The reason for that is twofold. First of all, I know that many of the young people that work at dispensaries are like many young people in Victoria, overeducated and underemployed. Uh, this is a large part of our population. Some of those overeducated people are educated in the health and wellness sector, alternative medicines, alternative health practices. And the dispensaries, we want to be located and understood next to an assumption of holistic health, of alternative medicine. We want you to be able to go to a dispensary and not just purchase cannabis products, but also have the possibility of purchasing perhaps other kinds of medicinal herbs, perhaps uh, doing other kinds of body work that assist with uh, chronic pain, such as Qigong, yoga, massage. Uh, we perhaps also obtain nutritional advice as well as advice on cannabis medicine. So we want that to be a possibility in this city. And I think that that would be an enormous step forward as a model that this city could present to the rest of the country Rather than selling cannabis alongside liquor stores, sending the absolute wrong message, let's sell cannabis alongside health and wellness services. That's all my comments for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine, and I am part-time employed at Trees. I wanted to thank you so much for your time today and for everyone else for coming out. Um, what I wanted to talk about is, um, I guess, a personal experience um, and something I've seen working at Trees. I've been taking marijuana medically for quite some time, and I still think I had a level of stigma when I entered the job. And that stigma was uh, pretty much cleared away with the level of knowledge, specifically seeing the people that come into the place to, to gather pretty much what they're looking for is, is access to relief. Uh, the average person, I would say, coming in there is probably around uh, 55 or plus. And again, I would agree with the gentleman in saying that the majority of these people are women. Edibles are really important in that aspect because I find a lot of these people aren't interested in getting high. They aren't interested in smoking. And edibles are providing an alternative in terms of being able to get an exact dosage. It's also, um, somebody brought up the, the item Buddha Ball, the Buddha Ball, which is a product that's a very high seller in our store, specifically because it also helps increase appetite. And some of these patients that are coming in have issues with eating. They have issues with keeping things down. And some of these edibles can be really an effective way for them to consume. So I felt that I, I agreed with actually a lot of the recommendations that have been outlined in the information sheet. 
And I did think that the one on edibles is something that the city needs to review because I think there's a huge limitation in the, the ability for people to access this. And that's, in, I think, the main importance that we need to be looking at, that this is a medication and we need to be providing safe access. So thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate your concern and that you guys are opening up this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hello, and thank you for uh, letting me speak tonight um, for the City Council. Thank you, Lisa, for uh, being an open <laughs> City Mayor and Council uh, and helping uh, move along. Uh, my partner, Hope Yayakakut, is uh, holding up some signs here. Um, first of all, let me give you some history about myself. I've lived in Victoria now for uh, all my life, born and raised here, basically, sorry. Um, uh, um, what else can I say? Um, I've worked with uh, the Cannabis Buyers Club now for about 10 years. Uh, I met uh, Ted Smith and worked closely with Dieter um, Mc McPherson. I'm nervous right now. And I uh, put together a little bit of a, uh, I guess, uh, help for patients down there over this time that I've, I've met them. Um, I'm kind of trying to bring a full circle for everyone here tonight about why compassion clubs are needed and especially for the edibles. And, uh, um, and treating yourself has been hard for me. I've been using medical marijuana, hmm, well, like recreational. I call it experimentational marijuana since 1974 because I really didn't know why it worked. Um, and until I came to the club, I started figuring out uh, uh, this and that and the other thing and put it all together. Basically, I believe that if you do not let um, compassion clubs make cookies for patients, they will find themselves in a heap of trouble pretty quick, wasting money, um, getting the wrong results. Um, the first sheet here, on the top is the acidic forms of cannabis. I don't know if anyone here knows about cannabis to the point that there is acidic forms and non-acidic forms. Um, when we're talking about treatments and using uh, cannabis, especially in, in the cookies and edible forms, we need to decarb decarboxylize. I'm glad I said that right. So we can uh, uh, eat the medicine and get a different result or not decarboxylize eat the medicine, wear the medicine, and get a different result. So this is really important information that people need to know through the Compassion Clubs. I didn't know this until I went to um, the uh, Victoria Buyers Club um, back in 2006, I think I signed up, started working with the people there, started like, asking questions. It was an open environment, and this is something that we need in the society, and especially around edibles. Um, I think when it comes to explaining this stuff, it took me a good two years to research this a good year to understand once I uh, absorbed it, of how to put it all together, how to use it as a medicine, how to avoid side effects, how to use uh, medicine without um, using too much money, how to actually double my uh, medicine because, believe it or not, there's long chain and short chain molecules in this medicine. Just as many medicinal uh, compounds are short chain as there is long chain. So not only acidic and active, there's long and short. So you can double your medicine, save money, actually understand what you're doing when you go through compassion clubs and work with them on how to cook. And uh, I think uh, that's where I wasted most of my money in my past, was cooking with this medicine, trying to make it myself, and finding out it didn't work, and then trying something else, going right back to smoking again. I, I had my biggest success, my most, my most uh, I guess, uh, successful cures and treatments that have come from uh, uh, working with the people there at the compassion Thank you club. Very much. And I appreciate your time today. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Hope. I've uh, been working with Ron and a lot of other activists in the city for about 20 years. I'm really grateful for the club's offering of a safe place to take my medication, to take a break, to meet other people who have a similar uh, need for this medication. I I'm not actually ingredients of smoking, so I 100% appreciate topical and edibles. Um, without it, my illness, which is not seen to the outside world, would um, continue to degenerate or degrade, and I'm unable to take other medications. I've tried a number of different ones, which they declared adverse reactions to. Um, nearly took my life a number of times. So I'm really grateful to this herb, and I'm grateful to the other herbs that the city allows to be legal, or, you know, because without the herbs of our Mother Earth, I would be in a very, very sad state. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. 
Hello, everyone. Mayor, Council, my name is Ryan Levis. Uh, I'm here to talk about mental health care in our communities and dispensaries as an avenue to get mental health services to our citizens. Um, it's imperative that dispensaries recognize the heavy amount of illnesses that are going around inside of their client base. And unfortunately, the provision of cannabis is not uh, qualifications on becoming a medical establishment. We have to be able to provide services and care for these people who are attending the dispensaries. Anyone who's had a chance to look at some of the intake statistics like I have will see a very clear pattern of a great deal of mental health stress. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada has outlined major roadblocks in legalization and it is important that we look at this as not a municipal uh, activity but as a uh, multinational and also a client-based approach. My preliminary research I hope to present to you, uh, I've submitted it here to Shannon, is the form of a biomedical and psychosocial audit that will look at individual dispensaries and assess them based on how many, how many care facility, how many ways in which they are attempting to care for our community. The proposed regulations have very little information uh, about disclosure of health information about the clients. Uh, this is very useful data for researchers and healthcare providers going forward. And as I continue on this audit and this research, I'm hoping that in the next year we will be able to make it uh, necessary for dispensary operators to have someone trained in suicide prevention. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ryan Levis. Take care. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hello. My name is uh, Shadrick Kane. I work in education here in Victoria, and I also uh, sit as an elected director on the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. To begin with, we'd just like, as an organization, say thank you for moving ahead in these regulations. Um, it is not a good idea to wait for the federal government, because we don't know when that'll happen, and we need to move forward. Um, at the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, all patients have a verified recommendation. And with that in mind, though we don't have many, and right now none, uh, the, pres the idea of denying medicine to, pres to prescribe medicine to minors is problematic to an adult, to a father, to someone who cares about children. Um, if a doctor has decided a child needs this medicine, who are you, who am I to stand in their way? One of the reasons we have medical cannabis in Canada is because of the very well-received images of children receiving cannabis and being alleviated of very serious concerns. 300 epilepsy attacks a day disappear. Not in everyone, but in enough that you should be considering this. Number two, alongside children, and once again, we don't have very many, uh, and all would be with a parent. I think that was a brilliant, uh, it's already handled. Edibles are a necessity in all these establishments. Um, at the very, and people have spoken to that already, but at the very least, please, please stick to your guns on oils, tinctures, and gel caps. They will make the difference between people's lives and not. Um, in my own personal experience, one gentleman we worked with over uh, four years had reduced opioids by 90% of his prescription, and it was due to cookies. Trading cookies for pills, and we want to reverse this. Have you seen the amount of opioid death reduction in Colorado? And lastly, uh, the declustering policy. The Vancouver Island Compassion Society and a very close neighbor of ours, the Vancouver, uh, sorry, the, the Victoria B Cannabis Buyers Club, have both been operating in locations in a downtown core where our patients, where our members reside very successfully for well over five years, seven years. You can talk about 17 years, with some, 20 years with some of these organizations. But in our current locations where we've found our homes is within 150 or so meters. To deny our clients our services after all this time seems very problematic to me. Um, we will continue to work with you, but I would like to see something in the proposed uh, regulations considering not declustering, but maybe site by site location uh, inve or investigation, whatever you need to do. But instead of a blanket policy, let's look at site by site. Um, and I'm done with that, except for saying as a teacher, education is a major policy that's missing in the federal, provincial, and local regulations. Thank, Thank you. you very much.
Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you very much for that welcome. Where's the yellow light? What's that? Where's the light? For uh, look down. This one? Great. Thank you. My name is uh, Bob Marsh. I am the current president and CEO of a company that is publicly traded, known as Worldwide Marijuana Incorporated. Strategy in one line is to acquire facilities across Canada to provide medical marijuana to those Canadians that suffer and have a need based on their condition. So I'm a quality of life guy. I offer to the councillors here, and I respect all of the opinions that have been provided, that where we're at is the foundation of law. And all of the dispensaries, according to the Governance and Priorities Committee report of November 19, operate illegally. From a businessman's perspective that could own 5, 10 LPs, the patients are being directed to really the corners to buy marijuana that you talk about. It's just that they have a storefront that you can enter and based on a number of profiles, it either looks really great or it looks a little bit seedy, but there is a moral and ethical purpose to these which I support. Our long-term vision in Worldwide is to merge with dispensaries and have them as either retail or wholesale outlets of the LP so that what we can do is clean up the methodology of rules that are imposed by the feds. And if you take a look at your title, there is no need for you to establish regulations for medical marijuana because they exist and the LPs are required to follow them up to and including security measures. So while I don't want to be the guy throwing water on the, net, the need for a dispensary or its moral or ethical place in our community, the basic issue is there is a legal method for you to follow and I would ask you to follow it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Well, that was a good introduction for my uh, little talk here. My name is Bin Huang. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Emerald Health Botanicals uh, Inc. We are one of the 20 or so companies that are fully licensed by Health Canada to grow and sell med medicinal cannabis to patients. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we like to use the word cannabis versus marijuana, but if you do a Google search, you actually have many, many more hits if you use marijuana versus cannabis. So that speaks to the lack of awareness and ed education in the field. Anyway, so the medicinal benefit of med cannabis is very compelling, and we don't dispute that. So uh, we actually, uh, as a licensed producer, we started... Uh, uh, providing medicinal cannabis to registered patients since last July, and we have been serving, um, we have uh, hundreds of patients on our registered list. We are also in the process of uh, um, production. We also have a production license for cannabis oil, and we're in the process of uh, developing formulations. I think we're also, at the same time, we are small. We are one of, I think we believe, I believe we are the only licensed producer in the capital region here on the island. We're also a very small business. We have less than 20 staff, um, but we do use local testing labs and uh, we um, do research, implant research, medical research, clinical research. So our economic impact is bigger than our uh, staff number would indicate. Uh, so as a licensed producer, we have to follow the very strict rules set up by uh, Health Canada, including security. Our staff have to go through security clearance with RCMP with Health Canada. But more importantly to patients, we have to follow very strict standard pharmaceutical standard for testing. I think we think that patients and doctors need to know what is in their product or also, as important, what's not in their product. The THC levels, THCA levels, CBD levels, CBDA, and all those cannabinoids have to be tested like so that patients know what they're getting. And they also need to know their products are free of pesticide, heavy metals, and uh, other contaminants, bacteria. So I think our key proposal here, we have a heard a lot of good inputs from everyone, and the key 
point I would want to make here is that whatever products we provide to medicinal patients, they need to have the quality assurance. Testing nationwide and uh, uh, standard testing is very important to ensure that patients know what they're getting and they have a safe product. So I think the city is doing a great service to everyone here, and it's a great forum here. I've heard very good points from um, uh, many speakers, and uh, we have a lot of product knowledge, Thank you very and we'll much. be happy to be uh, involved in the future process. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Steve Paulson. I'm a member of the Victoria Canada Spires Club, also a former employee there. I would like to talk on behalf of the shipping and hailing of products and delivery. I've had to personally go to members' houses because they've gotten out of the hospital, other various reasons why they haven't been able to go down to the club to pick up their medicine. There should be a way for everybody to at, or access their medicine all the time. And uh, also with the smoking room that the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club has, it's been there for God knows how long now. Uh, lots, over 100 people a day plus use it because they're not able to go smoke in their own home or anything. Uh, it should be allowed. It's not, or it's within the CRD regulations, it says that cannabis is not included with it. So, And also with uh, cookies and edibles, so many patients I've seen come through the door, their lives have changed because of these edible products and topical products. A lot of people don't want to be smoking the cannabis. They'd rather eat it and ingest it. I personally can't go home myself and make these cookies because I'll be evicted. So having the club there saves us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hi there. Um, so my name is Marion Smartin. Um, I'm a medical cannabis patient. I take CBD cannabis oil for my asthma and for pain. I have uh, I have digestive problems, and um, it actually helps my med my medical issues a lot. Um, I had tried like conventional inhalers before, and they they weren't working for me. So I'm really happy that I found uh, med medical cannabis. Um, I I have a card for four of the. Um, local dispensaries, so I am actually really well aware of all their different policies. So um, I'm just going to go over some of the regulations that I saw on your guys' website, the City of Victoria, and uh, why I think they're not really, why most of the regulations aren't necessary, really. Um, these regulations seem to be written by people who don't really understand the cannabis industry, in, in my opinion. Um, First of all, age restrictions. Um, most of the dispensaries already ask for ID. You must be 19. So that's already in place from the ones I've gone to. So it doesn't seem to be a problem for me. Um, I have a problem with the discrete signage and advertising um, regulation. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see why that's necessary. Pharmacies and liquor stores, they don't have to be discreet. And, uh, you know, Pharmaceuticals overall have way more deaths than cannabis has caused. There's literally been no one who's died of an overdose for cannabis, so it seems a bit overreaching for me. Um, the odor control um, regulation seems not necessary. I, I, I can never smell it from outside, like if you're walking by. If you're in, in the store, you can often smell it, but because it's right there. So, um, also, it, it is an illegal activity now, but it's going to be uh, approved soon by Trudeau. So I don't see why that should be an issue at all. Um, they want to limit the number of locations of the dispensaries. Um, I, again, I don't see why pharmacies don't have to who also have medication. The dispensaries have medication. So I think this should be more access for patients that need it. Right. Um, there's generally no side effects also with um, cannabis compared to um, pharmaceutical drugs. I, I work in a medical clinic, by the way, so I do have some... Uh, background on this. 
And also, another note, uh, cigarettes don't have to limit the number of stores they're sold in, so I don't see why cannabis should have to. Cigarettes are way more dangerous. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I had more, but that's, that's, that's okay. okay. You know what, you can, you can send us an email, or you can, if those papers are not, if you've got another copy, you can just give them to Ms. Craig now. So there's lots of ways to make sure we get your input. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Mary Ann Emmett, and I own a dispensary here in the city of Victoria. Just a few points I'd like to address. The first one is the hours. The uh, proposed regulations would restrict the hours of opening for dispensaries from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Generally, the hours that small children are awake. I find it interesting that we can sell and use alcohol up until 2 o'clock in the morning, but we would not be able to purchase marijuana after 8 p.m. at night. I'm not sure how that protects the population at large. Allowing people under 19 into a dispensary, I see no issue with that. The more we treat this as forbidden fruit, the more likely we are to uh, create a desire in young people to find out what's going on in these stores. On the issue of uh, pro the possible prohibition of di uh, dispensaries mailing product, I take issue with that. I cannot imagine a 17-year-old coming to me and paying me $20 on top to mail marijuana next week when he could get anything he wants at any hour of the day or night offered to him on Douglas Street. And the last thing that I'd like you to consider carefully is any prohibitions against uh, employers hiring people with criminal records. Outside of a conviction for something like racketeering, let's say, I think it would be very unfair to restrict us from giving people who have paid their debt to society the opportunity to start a meaningful and fruitful life and with uh, um, proper employment in one of our businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Simon Grant. Um, so I'm not as knowledgeable as many of the people here are, but, um, and yeah. Um, so I, I came in here and I was just looking through the sheet that you guys distributed, um, and you guys make reference to med medicinal or medical marijuana about six times throughout it, but at the same time, so at proposed regulations to address health and safety concerns, you write, marijuana is not an approved drug or medicine in Canada. The next sentence is medical marijuana-related uh, business. So, um, so for me, I would like the, uh, the government or the, ci the city to get a more definitive answer and act accordingly um, in response to that. So if it is not medicine, then do not distribute it as medicine and these, uh, these distribution sites. But if it is medicine, then treat it as such, so like um, in hospitals or, or pharmacies or stuff like that. And that's the, um, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, next speaker, please. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill. Um, I'm currently involved in obtaining an MMPR license for three facilities. We hope permission to produce medical marijuana shortly. We have been it for about three years now, and we've encountered uh, a lot of obstacles by Health Canada. They've changed the goalposts, they're requiring huge expensive outlays, and they're taking an inordinate amount of time to process apl applications. Um, the method of distributing marijuana to patients in small amounts of dry leaf is totally ludicrous. Um, I can't imagine giving a child a joint to smoke because for medicinal purposes, but that's what the federal government is making us do right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm in favor of the product being delivered in various forms, such as creams, bombs, pills, and oils. Uh, I'm also in favor of it being delivered through regulated outlets, such as dispensaries and pharmacists, that are legal with a doctor's prescription. I am in favor of legally distributed and controlled recreational sales. So right now we have quite a serious problem. The dispensaries that have sprung up in Vancouver and Victoria uh, are essentially illegal. Uh, I wish they weren't. Um, the passion, uh, compassion clubs and dispensaries receive their product from legal sources and they sell it illegally. And now the city wants to uh, give licenses uh, to those dispensaries and they're receiving proceeds of crime. 
of the Hells Angels receive process of crime and they get their clubhouse taken away. I sincerely hope you don't get yours taken away. <coughs> this place right here. I, I, I just, I would like to say briefly that I, I believe in dispensaries. I think this should be happening. I think that you should be spending a lot of your energy going to the federal government and telling them legalize dispensaries, legalize medicinal marijuana and recreational marijuana. It costs us a lot of money to boost our marijuana and we're competing right now against illegal dispensaries that are growing their product illegally and it doesn't cost them anywhere near as much. I would love to be able to sell my product to legal dispensaries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Council. My name is Magic Sterling. Um, I am on the board of directors of the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club. I also work at the Beer Brothers Society. I think that um, it's very important that we have edibles in many different forms. Um, we have been following Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> we have been making sure that everything has been tested, um, which was already stated through someone. Um, a lot of the dispensaries already do that, um, trying to follow and be compliant with what we believe will be coming down in the federal government. Um, as is with any medication through doctors, we need to make sure that the patients through dispensaries are given the same opportunities to find what works for them. Um, I also feel that uh, dispensaries feel a need for them who do not necessarily fit the parameters that are there now for licensed producers. And that we have a very big need, especially for the aging community who want to get off of pain pills, that are feeling adverse side effects. Dispensaries not only give them an option for that, they also give them a place that they can talk to others about what is there for them and what their options are, which is not anywhere else that I see. Um, and the other thing is having a safe consumption place, I think, again, is very important. I think that not only is it um, a place for people to safely consume, it is also for a place for people to network what is out there for them. A lot of people who are using our marginal society and may not know what is out there, they may not have left their houses for a long time and are now starting to because of this, um, because they have been feeling stigmatized by their medication of choice. So I just want to thank the City of Victoria for doing what they, they are doing and now I would again like to urge you to um, address the federal government and tell them to get a move on legalization or proper regiment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker please. Welcome. Hi. Thank you and thank you for doing all this. Um, my name is Deborah Diddick. I, th I'm so passionate about this. I've done the survey online. I've submitted a letter to you guys, and I even brought hard copy if you want it. I do have a long history with cannabis. I had my first toke when I was 18. That was 1972. Uh, the Doobie Brothers were singing Jesus is Just All Right, and it, ever since then, I have always wanted to see this herb become legal. But in 1996, I was diagnosed with stage three cervical cancer. Uh, long story short, I got no help from anyone and I started smoking pot again so that I could simply sleep. To this day, I, because of cannabis, I managed to avoid a radical hysterectomy the total removal of my lymphatic system and chemo and or radiation. They didn't know what they were going to do. They were just going to cut me up and french fry me to death. So I am a very strong advocate. That woman that spoke ahead of me, when I moved to Victoria three, four years ago, I knew absolutely no one. I couldn't grow my own medicine anymore. I can't make my own medicine. Otherwise, I get evicted. And magic told me about the Buddha balls. Because of the products at the VCBC, the Van Victoria, 
Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club, and also at the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. Their edible products have helped me get a, a grip of a 48 nicotine habit. Uh, I have gone from smoking a package of cigarettes a day, plus about 20 joints a day for all of my health issues, to where I'm now to maybe three to five cigarettes, but I use the edible products. I am finally back where I am able to work. It's only part time, but it's better than nothing. And magic was the one that told me about the edible products and I am ever so grateful to them. Plus also when I moved here, I worked on the Sensible BC campaign the majority of the people that came in to sign the petition at our office were in my age range, 50 to as old as 95 years old. So we need this medicine, we need the edibles. It will help us get away from alcohol, the prescription drugs that they keep pushing at us, and also I don't have to go buy my medicine on the street. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hi. My name is Victoria Cameron, and um, I have been working in landscape gardening for the past few years. I, I worked in broadcasting for 20 years. And I have a lot of pain. Um, I've also um, got some pretty serious PTSD from um, events that have happened in the past 10 years of my life. I've had about 10 traumatic events happen, including um, abuse um, from a relationship that I was in. The doctors, of course, wanted to put me on everything, every kind of, kind of um, prescription going. I think at one point I was on 14 different things for um, depression, anxiety. They told me that I was bipolar and put me on a bunch of other things. But what I found out was um, that all the medication that they had me on was actually making me crazy. So this March will be one year that I um, threw everything in the fire. Um, I was on morphine for pain, hydromorphone, you name it, I was on it. And I will be 100% um, prescription free in March, and it's thanks to edibles. Um, I'm not a huge smoker. I don't smoke tobacco. I'm, I'm not huge into the smoking of marijuana. I would prefer to eat it, but um, I eat it throughout the day, and I eat it before bed. It helps me sleep. I don't have nightmares anymore. I wake up in the morning. I feel great, um, and I think that it's... Um, you know, it's uh, definitely helped me 100%. Like, I'm a completely different person. Um, finally, the delivery of edibles. Um, Ted Smith wanted me to mention something he forgot to mention earlier was um, for people like Gail Quinn, his partner, that he, she's unable to get out of bed to come into town to get her medicine. Um, it's crucial that, you know, um, that we're able to, people are able to purchase, pick up the medication for people like Gail and people that are in the hospital and, and home in bed right now that they're not able to be here tonight. Um, that, uh, that's a very important thing, I believe, that um, we should be able to uh, help these people out. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Keynes. I'm on the board of directors for the Beard Brothers Society. And prior to that, I spent six years in the Navy. Um, when I first released from the Navy, I went through a very difficult time. I was suffering from a lot of mental health issues, and I wasn't doing well. I was quickly spiraling down a rabbit hole, and a friend reached out to me. He told me that what I was doing was self-destructive, and I needed to get a, a better grip on it. With his help, he suggested I try medical marijuana. Um, when I first tried it, there was a lot of stigmatization around it. I was very scared to go to a medical marijuana dispensary. I was worried about things being on paper and what Veterans Affairs Canada would say or my former military friends would say if they found out I was using marijuana. Um, as a result, I did not go to a dispensary. I found my supply off of the black market, as someone said, off of Douglas Street. Um, his exact words to me about what I was getting was, this is the fire, it's going to get you so stoned you can't see. That obviously was not what I was looking for. It didn't help me. I went home very unsure of what I had purchased. I was unsure of what I was using, and it just came in a flower form. I had used prior to that in high school, but only very, very short amounts, or very, very short time, 
very small amounts. Um, I'd like to see you guys move more on on-site consumption and safe inhalation sites. Um, it's something that touches very close to home with me. I wasn't able to reach out to the community. There was no safe place for me to go and learn about it. Even still right now, when people come into our dispensary to talk about it, new users, they have a hard time getting around it. A lot of elderly individuals have, have heard through their family members or their children that this is something that can help them. They come in and we'll spend an hour or we'll spend an hour and a half talking to them. A lot of the times because of the retail nature of our business and the limited size we have, it's very hard to, to get these people the information and the knowledge they need in these short windows of time. With, the, with being able to do other things on site, like have safe consumption sites for them, we can sit with them and help them regulate as they go through it. You know, you won't have people going home with large dose edibles and not knowing how much to take. You won't have these issues of people getting undesirable dosages at home where they're very unsure of what's happening to them, where they can increase their anxiety about using it because they aren't aware of what's happening to them. There's no one there to comfort them, to let them know that this is a normal process. Okay, you're feeling this way. Well, these are the reasons why this is how to avoid it in the future. You know, everyone is different, and when everyone starts to... Thank I'm you very time. much. Thank you very Thanks. much for hearing me. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hello. My name is Jeremy Allen. I'm the operator of Victoria's Natchway Medical Marijuana Dispensary. I just wanted to thank you all very much for what you've done for the city. The one thing I wanted to say was for edibles, uh, we do want them to stay in the city because they are an essential form of cannabis for the clients that we do provide to. And that is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Martin. Um, I have no business interest in, in marijuana. Uh, I personally run a, a software engineering firm. Um, I do have interest, however, in access. Uh, uh, myself, I suffer from generalized anxiety disorder and uh, uh, IBS, um, and I consume marijuana, marijuana in both, both by smoking it and by consuming it in edibles. Uh, I feel that access to edibles uh, is very important for me as it helps me deal with uh, a variety of gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, and smoking it helps me with the anxiety aspect, uh, which for my part is critical in uh, being able to uh, continue to work in my field as it's a very stressful one. Um, toward the end of uh, access to edibles, um, prior to becoming a member at a dispensary and one that provides edibles, um, my first experience with, ed with edibles was making them myself. Um, I was very successful in making uh, edibles, but I was not at all successful in uh, controlling the dosage. And I had one of the worst experiences of my life in doing so because of a, a, a very high dosage. Um, I would trust uh, those whose business it is to make edible marijuana products to uh, control that dosage and uh, provide the adequate labeling so that people like myself who do need access to it but aren't skilled enough to make it themselves can do so safely, can get access safely. Um, so yes, I, I would say that having access to edibles in a dispensary is critical for myself. Um, that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Morgan. I am a uh, bud tender at Beard Brothers Society. Uh, with that being said, I have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the patients there. Um, and a lot of those patients cannot uh, and will not uh, smoke. Uh, you know, cannot just based on uh, health uh, issues with their lungs and will not just due to some of the negative issues associated with smoking anything. Uh, with that being said, for me to have to tell some of my patients that I cannot help them uh, with an edible product is uh, fairly heartbreaking for me. Uh, I've seen a lot of, a lot of 
I mean, life given to these people, and it's truly amazing to be able to do that. Um, you know, numerous shifts, I've, I've cried seeing these people just really have their life back, and it's amazing, and I think it would be very unfair to take that away from them, uh, and I hope the city uh, rethinks this uh, regulation, and uh, that's about all I have to say. Thank you for the time, guys. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and uh, City Council. My name is Paul Peterson. I'm from uh, Vancouver. came over here today to, uh, to speak in favor of your uh, proposed regulations. My wife and I uh, run a boutique consulting and, and legal um, service in Vancouver. We've done a lot of work for a number of the dispensaries there as well as dispensaries in, in Toronto. Um, and we also do some work for one of the licensed producers, the Health Canada uh, licensed producers. And so I think it's given us a kind of a, a good um, sort of understanding of the industry. And I think the reason that I would applaud your decision to actually look at, at putting regulations in place is that whether you're against dispensaries or for them, you can't, it's hard to argue that um, the, the Health Canada system is a complete failure. There is a, around 38,000 patients across the entire country using Health Canada licensed producers, and there is between two to 300,000 patients using Vancouver-based dispensaries. The reason that the Health Canada system has failed is because it doesn't provide reasonable access. Uh, patients do not want to order cannabis through the mail. It's plain and simple. They don't want to order a product that they cannot see and smell and look at. Uh, that's why dispensaries exist. They exist because people want them, because consumers want them, and consumers want to actually see their medicine before they buy them. As we know, there is some, some changes federally. Uh, it looks like all the cannabis is heading to an adult use. I think in the next two years, dispensaries will exist in a legal form, either provincially or federally. Um, so, so I applaud cities like Vancouver and Victoria for obviously taking a proactive stance to this. Some, some four points I want to actually address quickly. Uh, first is duration of a license. I think that's something that you guys should look at. I know Vancouver has, has looked at it as being for one year. Uh, I, I think addressing duration will also create the flexibility so if and when federal provincial regulations do change, then there's not going to be a lot of upset dispensary owners who have invested um, time and money into setting up a facility and, and not un really understanding. Uh, to uh, the 200 meter declustering rule, I think it's very important to look at that. I think in, if the goal is to have a lot less dispensaries, I think there's better ways to do it than through a declustering of 200 meters. Um, in Vancouver, we've had a number of clients that have gained the system um, around uh, sort of demerit points and, and demerit points to their neighbor. Signage, I think that's very vague um, in your regulations. And then also, lastly, what constitutes uh, medical use? Is it, uh, is, it, is it a doctor prescription? Is it, is it prescription from a natural path? Um, we, we've looked at a number of the best practices in Colorado and Washington State, um, and, and we've helped them and our, our clients uh, with these. And, and I think it, by looking at the, um, the, the best practices in Canada as well as in the U.S., um, I think this program could be put together in such a way that nobody is embarrassed, and I think it will provide ready access, reasonable access to the citizens of Victoria. Again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Well, my name is Robert, and this is one of my first times ever doing this, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> um, um, just in retrospect, um, that gentleman was really well spoken. I really liked his uh, speech. Um, just a little bit of background because I misunderstood some of the stuff that I'm not really kind of aware of. Would have been a little bit um, uh, better to kind of comprehend his uh, speech. So I just want to kind of comment on that if that's okay. Um, now with pot, I just wanted to clear up a, a, a rumor that's going around that you guys are going to be um, closing shop and closing them all down, and that's what you're aiming to do. Is that true or not? No, that's not true. That's why we're here tonight to discuss proposed regulations for these businesses. And there's more and more of them seems to be cropping up all over the place. So anyways, um, it sure beats, you know, going in the streets and, and having to deal with kind of like people that, you know, Whatever, but hey, uh, off topic, but on a very relevant thing, and I don't know if the Prime Minister really cares, but this is important, is um, creating new job uh, opportunities and new jobs. And I was wondering if you can kind of maybe kind of like um, um, collaborate on that and see if you can come up with anything. 
because that's what needs to happen because the economy is kind of going a little bit kind of kaput. Um, uh, a lot to do with the spending um, style of, of the Prime Minister. Um, it's kind of like um, it's going out of style the way he, he spends money. He makes promises and promises and and all the money is going to have to be um, coming from somewhere. Hopefully we don't have to print it and just kind of spend it, you know, like the Americans, but that's my guess. <laughs> so um, I got to get more politically kind of like adept to understand politics and stuff, but I'm slowly, truly getting there. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yes. Next speaker, please. Okay. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, time here. Um, I just wanted to point out one thing. Um, I was wondering if anybody else saw this as a contradiction in one of the two of the rules that were being proposed um, in that the discrete signage type thing, it should be very discreet, right? But then for safety, we should also keep the windows open so you can see inside the dispensaries for very other reasons. Um, so I just wanted to see if that was some sort of discrepancy or uh, if it makes sense at all. Um, my story is I've smoked pot my whole life and I grew up smoking it because my dad taught me it was better than alcohol. And that was based on his experience with friends passing away from chronic alcoholism since university up on. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I, I never thought that there was any other way to do it but smoke it because my only experience with edibles was some friends making brownies in grade 10 and we got way too wailed and people got sick and it was terrible. Um, so negative experience. Later on in life I suffered a bad injury to the knee and this really impacted my ability to work as a landscaper. Um, basically I tried a lot of other prescribed medications. I was on codeine initially and when I got to medical marijuana clinics in Vancouver, they started educating me on how pot actually affects the system, how it comes into the system, what's appropriate for your condition. And I thought that was just the most amazing, amazing experience because I actually was able to narrow down what works for me and it ended up being an, an, an edible. Um, I was on brownies for a little while, and then I switched to something else, and blah, 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 blah. And then through being able to experience different types of edibles in the dispensary system, I was able to narrow down exactly what works for me. And that kind of self-medication isn't traditionally accepted in big pharma-type situations. So that was basically my uh, main comment here. But since I have a minute left, um, I just wanted to say that this is kind of the precedent for the rest of Canada. And... When you guys put some laws in place, the, Toronto's going to be looking at you because there's dispensaries now popping up all over Toronto. And most of my family's in Toronto, and they're thrilled to have access finally and to have people to help educate them and all this other stuff. And their biggest proposal is we should serve it in the alcohol stores, which is the worst possible combination. <laughs> if anybody who's been kind of drunk and then eaten an edible or smoked pot, it's, it's like worse than being drunk. It's way worse than being drunk. It's disorienting. It's sickening. Why are we encouraging that? So I hope that we move towards like a medical, uh, sorry, an edible-based dispensary system because that's going to be the main way that we're going to be carrying on as uh, people phase out smoking in every form of society for years to come. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. Um, my name is Bill Stewart. Uh, I'm a medical can uh, cannabis patient at the BCBC and a number of other dispensaries around town. I've also been uh, a volunteer with Hempology and worked with, uh, with Ted Smith in, in uh, promoting awareness of cannabis. Um, I wanted to thank you for for taking the initiative to, to regulate this in a time when the federal government has failed to take any. Um, I was here at the meetings last year when you were first uh, addressing the, this as a possibility and you were very compassionate in your understanding of uh, wanting to bring in regulations that wouldn't impose hardships on the membership. And I can actually recall being moved to tears three times at the meeting here, and which is something I would expect to happen more over at McPherson Playhouse than in, in, in council chambers. But, um, but I did, I did want to make uh, uh, just a few points. Um, I believe if you do prevent a safe consumption sites, you will cause har hardship. Um, if you ban edibles, uh, you will cause hardship. And if you ban delivery, 
uh, home delivery, again, you will cause hardship. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, I, again, thank you so much for, for doing this and for taking a, a stance and, and having the courage to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello there. Um, I'm a very nervous public speaker, so I apologize if I stumble over my own words. My name is Alicia Zege, and I work for Trees Dispensary. I've worked a number of positions there. I've worked most of the positions in that company, actually. I've answered phones and emails, and I've covered social media. And the most common question that constantly comes up is, do you deliver? Can you mail it to me? I'm three hours away. I'm five hours away. I can't get out of bed. I, I haven't been able to eat anything in three days. And every day I, I have to tell them no, and I feel awful. But we should. We should definitely allow delivery, especially within the city limits. I mean, Health Canada delivers it by mail. Why not us? Uh, pharmacies deliver it. So again, why not us? Quite often, the people that need cannabis most are the ones that are least able to access it. I feel that we should be able to give them better access. Um, we've already discussed edibles at length, so I will just say that I agree with most of the people that have spoken that edibles should be allowed. And I would also like to echo the lovely woman who believed that our hours should remain as they are, simply because well, yes, liquor stores and Home Depot are open later than 8 p.m. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Badko. Um, everyone has already pretty much addressed everything I would have wanted to say. I just want to add one little point which is uh, um, I think that everyone in this room, especially on the decision-making table side, should read a book called The Medical Cannabis Guidebook. Um, if there's anything you're going to read between now and decision time, it is called The Medical Cannabis Guidebook by Jeff, J-E-F-F, Ditchfield, D-I-T-C-H-F-I-E-L-D, and Mel Thompson. Um, it will give you everything from the historical record of cannabis right up to how to use it. Um, you will discover things like the fact that the word marijuana is actually uh, a racist term and it is rooted in the 1920s, the Prohibition era. Prior to that, it was always and forever called cannabis and its root derivation, you should look up on Google, the etymology is goes back to Greek. Um, you should, from here forward, just call it cannabis. Um, just a quick little tip on that marijuana being racist. It's like some people that wanted to make it illegal chose a term that was recognized as a term used by minorities, Hispanics. Um, there's an extreme racism on public record in the U.S., from Prohibition, and you will read that in this book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Susan, and um, I'm recently returned to the medical marijuana, uh, being able to access it instead of on the street uh, or through friends or in secret has been an incredible and uplifting experience to actually go to some of the dispensaries and to relearn everything that I thought I learned back in the 1970s. I am very much your 1950s, your, your 1950s woman who walks in there who has things like PTSD and fibromyalgia and if I didn't have that uh, marijuana in my life right now, mostly edible, because <laughs> I can't smoke, my lungs don't do that anymore, um, then I wouldn't be able to function as a human being, and I actually function in, um, in, a, in a 
area of medicine that um, you need to be thinking on your feet at all times. So to know what the dosage is and to do all that kind of research myself is very arduous. And the dispensaries uh, and the um, compassion clubs actually fill that purpose and it's desperately needed. Especially when we start going to our doctors and our medical people and we say to them, um, well, we need you to believe in us and that we need this medical marijuana. Well, guess what? For the last six years, we've been experiencing problems with even finding a doctor for regular, for regular uh, illnesses and to actually find somebody that you get along with that will actually sign that doctor's note um, inhibits my accessibility to those things if I have to bring it in. Um, the uh, healthcare system, as far as I can see, is pretty heavily burdened, both the mental, uh, the uh, 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 <laughs> dementia, dementia patients could possibly use it. If we, if we, I guess what I'm asking you is to make sure that when you make our rules, and it is all of Canada that's looking at this right now, to make them not so broad that we can't control them for our, our, uh, uh, our laws, but to not shorten it so much that uh, we can't get to it because there's other systems that are falling down right now as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Francie, and I was an alcohol and drug counselor in BC for 20 years. And I'm also a member of the Victoria Compassion Club. And um, at this point, I wanted to speak to the inhalation room. Some people complain about the smoke. Few, and I have not met them. And I hardly smell it. Many smells happen every day. Gas, perfume, cooking, paint, but marijuana is non-toxic, and some don't don't and some who don't smoke it like its smell. It is a well ventilated room, but the room is in a very important part to many who need it. It is a touchstone and a life link to many who are too ill to travel and who need to rest and medicate. The staff are available to drop by and share themselves and their knowledge. New and lasting friendships develop away from stigma. New and lasting friendships exist amongst many of the, the participants. It reduces their isolation. Meetings, uh, meeting others with challenges gives us all a sense of community. People share their stories, their recoveries, resources, ideas about community services, methods of taking medicines, social events, volunteer opportunities, and well wishes. The room provides a welcoming environment to be found nowhere else. For me, the room was my first contact with the cannabis community and its group members. It reduced the impact of stigma and encouraged me to be mindful of my health. Please continue to understand the vital role of the inhalation room, and also the same goes for the delivery system. Too many are too ill to travel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Okay. Um, I already spoke. I'm just going to submit the rest of the staff. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak this evening? Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Helps and uh, Council. Boy, I'm really impressed you guys have gone this far. <laughs> I am a medical cannabis user. I have a federal government license. I feel really bad about still feeling criminalized because I've got nowhere I can go use my medicine. I have to go home and stay in my closet. I don't have anywhere I can have my medicine. I'm lucky I have these clubs to go to so I can get it because the 
process the government wants to put in place, the federal government, is uh, really arduous. Right now I'm lucky I get to retain my license and my personal growing license based on the Allard decision, which kind of grandfathered people that currently had licenses before a certain date get to maintain them. So I'm lucky in that respect. However, if I had to go reapply for my license, I would be pushed into this new regime, which isn't so comforting as the dispensaries that I get to go to. So about the regulations, because I know I'm sort of limited with my time, I do believe a safe in inhalation site or consumption site is, is a really good thing to have. It is social. It, it brings community to the people that need this as a medicine. And uh, many positive experiences come from that social interaction. Um, I am also a former employee of the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club and uh, a former director on the Hempology 101 Society. I'm well versed in the arguments that have gone on for the last 20 years working alongside with Ted. And uh, there's something to be said about the experience you gain from meeting all the people that need this as a medicine. Um, some of them have come from far away and they needed to be able to try their medicine before they went home with a large amount. And it's so as to not get home and find out that it wasn't the right strain. One of the reasons those consumption rooms were, were needed was so people could try their medicine first before they went home with a larger amount. The other thing about this is the, let's see, where was that list? I had a list, I can't remember now. Short term memory thing, you know. <laughs> Well, for me, I'm getting older these days. The, the consumption site is really important. And I think also the fact that people need to have it when they can't get to it. If they couldn't get into town to buy their lunch, then they needed someone to bring it to them or send it to them. So a delivery system of some sort is necessary for those that are shut-ins that can't access it and can't send somebody in that they can trust that's going to bring it to them. So those are all the things I say. I'm really impressed that they've gone this far already. Uh, keep going. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Welcome. Hey, hey guys. Uh, yeah, thanks for having the people here able to like say what they want to say and not just I don't know, shutting everybody down. Appreciate that, guys. Like, I mean, what happened in Nanaimo was like, Terrible, I believe. I mean, I understand like some of the dispensaries out there are more legal than others, I guess. And yeah, uh, let's see what we got here. Um, like the home delivery thing, how are, like if someone is so ill that they can't even get out of bed, how are they supposed to get their medicine when like it just doesn't make any sense? So there's that, and then what was the other one? Um, yeah, not being able to eat cookies. My mom's got a bad hip, and like, I'm sure you guys don't smoke, or some of you smoke, or whatever, and you wanna be able to just, like, how are you supposed to consume your medicine if you can't, like, eat it? Like, I don't know. Some people just don't like smoking. I like smoking, but that's me. Um, what else is there? Uh, not being able to smoke on, like, um, the safe inhalation sites. They just, like, what, are we supposed to smoke in the park and then get a, a fine, a $200 fine for, like, being in possession? So, like, what are we supposed to do, you know? Or I can't smoke in my apartment. I mean, I could, but then I might get evicted, and that's just not worth it to me. I like balconies, but I mean, I'm sure there's other laws that you can't smoke on balconies or whatever. It's just ridiculous. Um, let's see, what else is there? Yeah, this meeting is really important because if you guys start making laws, it's going to affect all of Canada, not just this city. Like, this isn't just a city thing. This is like a, a big thing. It's, yeah, what else is there? Uh, the edibles, yeah, people need to be doing that. And, like, I don't know, I just hope they don't start, like, capping the edibles. Like, oh, you can only get, like, 
half strength edibles when this person who's coming off of like heroin or opioids or whatever is going to be in so much pain because they can't smoke or whatever and like they can't get enough into their system without causing like their own harm like you know coughing your lungs out over some like stuff or it's just it needs to have you know potency anyways thanks that's what i have to say about that thank you very much uh, next speaker please Welcome. Hi, my name is Daniel McIntosh. Um, I was just inquiring on the detail. It's more of a question than anything. Um, for the proposed regulations to address security concerns, you say under J, it says no other business can conduct on the premise of a storefront medical marijuana retailer. Um, as far as that goes, does that segregate head shops from dis dispensaries? Or would it combine the two into one um, legal outlet? Mr. Coates? I think that's a pretty difficult question to answer on the surface, and so uh, the idea is that a dispensary is a dispensary singularly, and, and it would be whether there's ancillary uh, products that are related to that is, um, I think, not clear at this point. Um, just, okay, thank you. Wait. Thank you. you, you can, we're, we're looking for input tonight, so if you've got some suggestions, now's a good time to make them. Um, no, at this point, no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll outline at the end uh, how people can give input beyond this evening as well. Further speakers? Okay. Not really, because then everyone will want to speak one more quickly. But, um, but having said that, Mr. Coates, could you bring up the, the slide? Uh, so we'll talk about next steps. So what, while we can't have everyone speak one more time, uh, we can have anybody uh, send us an email uh, or complete the online survey or both. So if you want to send an email, um, Shannon will be gathering the input. So it's S. Craig. So S. C R A I G at victoria.ca. So send us your follow up thoughts. Maybe you heard something tonight and you had a, a thought that you'd like to share. So you can send an email to Shannon. Uh, you can also fill out the online survey until March the 4th. Uh, the next steps, I'll just go out, uh, go over them again, uh, is we will, um, staff will review all of the feedback and develop final recommendations to council. Uh, then we will, they will develop an education and enforcement strategy. Um, they'll present the final feedback and final recommendations and the strategy to council in April. And then that's where I think we'll have to have some really uh, interesting, challenging, rich conversations uh, about the proposed regulations. We will, um, uh, many of you mentioned the federal government. We will share the feedback and our proposed direction with the federal government and we'll ask for their input. Uh, we've written to them on this matter already. And then the final step in whatever regulations we decide to move forward with uh, will be a series of bylaw amendments. And bylaw amendments are made at a regular council meeting uh, on a Thursday evening and there's an opportunity for members of the public uh, to speak at a council meeting when bylaws are being addressed. So if you feel like this is your last time to speak with us on this matter, it is not. Uh, with that, um, thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a good evening.